Oh, good afternoon. Okay. So just, just a word to our two guests. Um, this talk is part of the diploma course. So the other members here present have been studying uh, different subjects as we've been going along. And the two subjects that we're going to look at today are involution and evolution. Um, I'm saying this because it would hardly be um, very simple for, very easy for um, new people to come along and just pick up where we were. But I'll try to make it as um, user friendly as possible. But if you bear in mind that the, the, the students have done some studying on this subject, my task today is to help to clarify some points and to give you an opportunity to ask questions based on what you've been reading so that your, your mind can be clear on, on what you've asked to understand. Um, I once again I'll remind you that the diploma course only looks really uh, properly at principles, not at uh, in-depth details. In all these subjects we could go into very great detail and, and on some of them we have in other places. But in this course we're sticking to the principles and only as much detail as we need to support the uh, understanding of those principles. Um, I just could start by reading a little piece. Theosophy affirms that the universe is a single whole and that one life animates every part of it. All beings and all forms emerge from and have their root in the one universal life, the first cause of all cosmic creation or emanation. Now, in the last subject, um, we looked at um, the creation of the cosmos, if you remember, and at that point we were actually really considering the third aspect of the Logos which is Fohat in creating the planes of nature from the spiritual plane to the physical plane. We briefly looked at how that is accomplished and the cycles of activity which are involved in that um, and that's all we needed to do in, in this course. Now we're looking at the same thing again in the subject of involution and here we see that, um, as with a lot of this course, um, and a lot of basic theosophical knowledge, each time you study a different subject, you'll find there's an overlap. For instance, a good example of this would be, if you're studying karma, the law of karma, then when you come to study reincarnation, you will naturally be looking at karma again, because karma operates over several lifetimes. And so we have this... Um, this thing that we are looking at the same things very often but we're doing it from a different point of view in this talk we're doing it from the point of the one life involving itself in the matter that that Paul had created when it created the planes when it created the planes it created the matter of those planes now we're looking at the second aspect of the Logos which we call Mahat which is actually a universal mind, or the divine mind, the mind of nature, there's so many words for it, but basically it's, it's mind, it's feminine principle and it's mind. Um, through its action, through its, in, in, through its evolutionary process, it becomes known as wisdom, divine wisdom, and it has other names then, such as Sophia. And so we have the word Theosophy, which is compound of Theos, which is derived from Theogonia, which is Greek for of gods, and Sophia, which is wisdom. So Theosophy actually means the wisdom of the gods, plural, not singular. We don't believe in a god. But we do believe in, in um, many beings with great power who issue forth at the beginning of a creation and remember it all from a previous time. So those are known in the um, mysteries as the gods. 
And so now it is the term for Mahat, the divine mind, the feminine principle, to actually start to um, occupy these planes, to use the matter that's there and to organize it into forms which it can take up residence within and express itself within and experience. So we can see this very simply on the physical plane because the physical plane all around us is full of forms of very varying types from stones to ants to human beings to trees and so on and so on and so on. All these are forms which are made out of the material of the physical plane which the spirit or that aspect of the spirit which is conscious the divine mind then occupies and experiences through so you are, your divine self is occupying your physical body and it is experiencing the physical world and its fellow creatures through that um, interface, through the five senses. It's expressing itself also. So this is the process that's taking place in involution. Um, what we have to do now is we have to consider this from a starting point which is rather obscure. I used the example of physical forms just then because that's the simple side of it. We can see very clearly what I'm talking about. This is a body, this is made of physical material. This has been organized by Maha, by the divine mind, and then it is occupied by that. But when we start at the spiritual plane, where all this begins, you can't refer to a physical body. We can't refer to things as such. And here we have one of, the, one of the very basic and important principles of this course and of theosophy and of esoteric knowledge and that is that everything that we perceive around us actually has its origins on the inner planes. Nothing has its origin here. Absolutely nothing has its origin in this world. Everything we see around us, everything that we are, is an effect of causes that were laid down eons ago in previous cycles on inner planes. Our physical bodies are modelled on our astral bodies, which were laid down ages and ages ago. Um, those astral bodies were actually templates drawn from thought forms in the divine mind at the mental level. So, this is the principle that everything we see has actually had its, its beginnings on the spiritual plane. What happens then is, that is then taken a step further onto a lower plane, where it's made more substantial, then it, then it progresses to a more dense plane still, where it is again more substantial. We, we're talking about going from the spiritual plane through the mental plane, into the astral plane. By the time... Um, things get to the, these ideas get to the astral plane, they're getting feelings and um, substance to them and shape and form. Then eventually they come into the energy world and with the quantum world we call it and then the physical world. But the complication arises from the fact that when this process starts the, the beginnings of everything are so um, so subtle that we would hardly recognize anything there at all. Imagine, if you can, the divine mind establishing itself on the spiritual plane and actually um, just moving, moving in terms of energy on that plane. The material of that plane is so fine that, and so insubstantial that that movement is hardly recognisable. But what is happening is archetypal patterns are being established at that level. And here is another principle that everything follows the same patterns from their beginnings. So when you look at something on a physical plane you can actually trace it all the way back to the spiritual plane where it's the same pattern but because it's so um, insubstantial 
you can't see it as a thing this is why I say this is this is a deep side of the subject because you have to use your imagination and your intuitive skills here to try and imagine what a thing would be like at that level that it can't even be called a thing yet it's a movement it's a differentiation and what we're saying is that the matter of that plane has been moved and changed however however slightly and therefore in that place at that point is different from the basic matter of that plane which hasn't been affected does that make sense to you? it's a bit like saying I can draw, draw, draw us down to the physical plane for an example it's like saying you've got a very still body of water perfectly still and a fly lands on the surface and then takes off again that little tiny bit of energy that landed on that surface has caused a little ripple which will wear out which will run out over maybe a few inches or a foot or so and the rest of the water hasn't been affected but those molecules of water where the fly landed are different now to all the rest because they've been through a specific pattern when things come down to the next level which we would say proper would be the higher mental plane what we're looking at is very vague but nevertheless um, complete thought forms so the divine mind now is projecting a thought into the mental plane and it's there are um, hierarchical beings elemental beings who actually respond to that thought and hold it in, in, a, in a, an appropriate form and so we talk about eventually we talk about thought forms don't we we say thoughts are things we refer to ourselves aren't we so when I think of an orange it actually becomes a thing in the mental plane for a while it doesn't last it dissipates because I'm not going to keep on thinking about it but if I could hold my mind on the image of an orange all the time that I'm holding it it is there on the mental plane and it's held in that form by elemental beings who respond to my will so this is this is the process you see the other way around it is the divine mind doing this establishing archetypes now when we get down to the emotional levels of the mental plane and where they can coincide with the astral plane we have a field day for psychiatrists don't we and psychologists where they talk all the time about archetypes mm. or um, unconscious um, say it better the unconscious they talk about the, the unconscious but, but they also <coughs> don't they say that it's there is an unconscious that we all share yes absolutely mm. yes. Yeah, it's not just our unconscious no. So, here we are, you see, the archetype of a human being is shared by all human beings. Mm -hmm. And there are countless variations within that archetype. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're allowed for within the, let's even call it the mathematics of that structure. Mm -hmm. So, um, when evolution, we'll come to this in, in, later, when evolution reaches the point of hum humanity it is actually displaying on a physical level a physical rendition of that archetype and each human being is expressing a certain variation on that theme so when you look at people they've got slight differences haven't they I was on a train the other week and a man got up and he said good God uh, do you, have you come from I don't know anybody what he said, some place I've never heard of. And I said, no. He said, well, you've got to double then. <laughs> but actually, you see, if, if, if we'd have put his version of me and me next to one another, we wouldn't be the we same at all. No. But in his memory, it was close enough, and he thought, oh. Like fingerprints. Like fingerprints, yeah. Fingerprints, they say, and that genetic... Um, testing they say one chance in so many million or something mm. because it will be repeated somewhere along the way. Mm. but this again is part of the evolutionary process that comes later 
where form is taken as a basic template and then developed. So let's let's finish dealing with involution first, because what I'm talking about here is the, the involving a spirit in matter, and that's an easy way to think of what the word involution means as opposed to evolution. Involution means involving itself in matter. Spirit, the one, fragments itself into matter. It involves itself in matter, and in doing so it breaks itself up. It, it um, diversifies, it fragments. So when you look at now at the physical plane, which is the densest point of matter, you see countless billions of fragments of the Divine One. That one has now become so many, you can't count them. Every atom is a spark of that Divine. How many atoms do you think you have in your body? Trillions. And each one is a being in its own right, which is a, has a p little piece of divinity within it, which is evolving. And eventually, in some time so distant that we can't even think of it, that little spark in an atom will be a human being. Because we weren't just invented like that. We've evolved to what we are from the most basic, simple spark of the divine. And that is what the whole process is about. It's about the divine involving itself in its process to unlock the potentials of all the aspects of itself. It's like the one being puts itself out into the many. And you could say, let's make it easier, the divine self is a flame, a beautiful flame. And what all this is, a spark thrown out from the flame. And as each spark feeds on material, and the material is experience, then they become little flames in their own right. Until eventually all these sparks are now flames. This is, this is an incredible concept. You imagine the, you know, creation is being filled with potential divine flames, which are, to start with, only divine sparks. The scientists have discovered now, haven't they, an atom that is in every single thing. Did what? you not see it on television? No, no. A couple of weeks ago? No, week no. Or so ago, they have discovered an atom that is in every single thing. Everything that they can identify, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or the boson, or they, they, they haven't discovered it yet, it's a theory. No, they, they, they have discovered it. Where? Well, at CERN? Yeah. I, I, I can't did, they, did they do it at CERN? Yeah, I wasn't sure about that. Cause I don't think that they are claiming that it is the Higgs boson. They're saying it. Yeah, well, they were looking for it, weren't they? Yes. Definitely, yeah. They've discovered it, yeah. But what, what do but you they think? They called it, or by a certain name, by somebody that said that there was one. I can't yes. remember the name, because then you remember. Yeah. They've called it mm. by his name. Who's the well, I can't remember his name. Some he came up on. with the theory. Yeah. Yes. 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 Well, what do you and think? They've done it in Switzerland with a great big tunnel up. So, what do you think the Higgs boson is then? Well, if it's in everything, it's a divine spark, but they no, wouldn't be no, able to. No, nothing, nowhere near the divine spark. No, <laughs> you can't see the divine spark in a machine. <laughs> It's six planes away. You know, yeah. what science is working on now is the quantum levels of the physical plane. Not the astral plane, not the mental plane, not the buddhic plane, not the atomic plane, not the spiritual plane, not the monadic plane. That's where your sparks are on the monadic plane. That's where they're thrown out from. That's what, that's what their true nature is. See, science is looking at this from, from the gross inwards. And, and it's like trying to penetrate this, this <coughs> fog of mud, which is actually the physical stuff itself. You know, there's um, one of the most ancient gods of all human experience is Isis. Mm -hmm. right? Now, Isis is said to be veiled. It's the veils of Isis, the seven veils of Isis. Manon Blavatsky wrote a book, Isis Unveiled, didn't she? Mm -hmm. The veil is the physical world. Mm -hmm. Lying behind physical matter is what's lying behind the veil. But what scientists is doing is they're pulling apart the veil. Well, they, they'll get through eventually and loop through the veil, but then they'll start all over again. Because yeah. the pattern is going to repeat itself. Yeah. 
Yeah. So what the Higgs boson would be uh, in terms of the perennial philosophy and esoteric science would be the background state of the physical plane or what we call the etheric plane which is the quantum world to science that this is a structure and energy forces underlying and within and upholding the atoms now um, each plane has at its very highest point a field it's a bit like um, like a carrier signal onto which a, a signal is broadcast so when you put your radio on or your TV your, your signal you're receiving is 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 being transmitted along the carrier wave mm. without that carrier wave it would scatter mm. so each plane has a carrier wave called a kasha which actually um, infuses the whole of that plane with a, with, a, with a divine sort of note and onto that note then all these differentiations can then sit in their own proper places so the Higgs boson if it exists, if they can actually see it, would be part of that uh, carrier wave of the etheric plane. They also call it dark matter, don't they? They say the whole of space is filled with dark matter. And what they're saying is, we we can see a lot of light matter, but we can't see dark matter because we can't see, we haven't got dark eyes. But we can assume that because we only can see, you know, a tiny fraction of things in space and those things have to have something within which to move otherwise they wouldn't be able to keep their form and their shape and their cohesion then the background must be matter which is dark dark matter because we can't see it and then you call it Higgs boson or you call it something else the same principle you and I have to have a world in which to live in mm. atoms also have to have a world in which to live in and that world science is calling dark matter now but don't let anybody tell you that's the astral or the mental or the spiritual no it's just part of the etheric mm. it's a pity you see that, that scientists can't accept more readily um, the ancient teachings as in fact Einstein did mm. and it's, it's rumoured quite you know, quite substantially that Einstein is copied the secret doctrine was so well thumbed that they're, they're, they're saying some people are claiming that his EMC square was based entirely on what he read in there and I could, I could vouch for that because you can find that kind of stuff in there but science will only so far accept that which you can measure quantify and or express in mathematical terms and that this is a problem now because maths are going way beyond reality mm. they're putting figures in there that don't belong anywhere really and they're coming up with answers such as 10 parallel universes mm. where the heck did they get out from 10 parallel universes it wasn't good enough for them you know, theoretically it may, it may be sound it may be um, logical and you may be able to put maths and equations to prove it or to, to mm. display it but it's not it's nothing you can actually do anything with, is it? Mm. Unlike electricity and magnetism and mm. chemistry and electronics, which is what they do best, really. Hey, this is just another tiny breakthrough for science. Yeah. They're going to discover that behind that is another reality. Yeah, and so on. Yeah. And so on. on and on and on. Yeah. With, this is wrong with that because that, you know we do need we, civilization in order to proceed has relied heavily on science over the last few hundred years and it's going to rely on it even more heavily in the future because <laughs> science has got us in such a mess in a way with the environment that it, we need science now to get us back out of it again because we're not going to go back to living in caves are we? I don't think so no. so this is the principle then that which is cohesive and one and, um, and is divine in pushing out into the planes of matter actually breaks itself up into, into fragments of countless aspects of itself which can then relate to each other 
you go on because you I'm want to say. I'm following the train of thought, Eric, and I have to ask my the question you can't, <laughs> to be able to listen to the rest. When you said just now, but the spark is, you know, much further back in the other realms that we occupy. I always thought of the spark as being in my physical self as well. And are you saying that it isn't? <laughs> well, you're paying attention, aren't you? Good for you, paying attention. But what would you say it again, man? Yeah, uh, because oh, I'll say it a different way. Because mm. what is actually residing within each atom is the same thing as residing within your body, which is you. Your spirit isn't in your body. Mm. Its consciousness is in your body, but your spirit is on the spiritual plane. Now it's the same with the atom. The spiritual spark that animates an atom remains on the spiritual plane and it, and it evolves there. But its ability to vivify matter is, is what it puts out. It's a, an emanation, if you like, a thread mm. attached to every atom where its own nature is, is um, transmitted energetically, but it's, it's, it, it remains where it is. This is why in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says to Arjuna, all this I create, yet I remain. Ah! <laughs> that the penny just dropped, didn't it? Yeah. That explains yeah. something. Yeah. So basically, you see, if I rang you up when I got home, and I start telling you, you know, if you said to me, ring me up later and tell me how to get this program running on my computer, so I ring you up and say, okay, Greta, go, go to Windows, go to Start, go to Control Panel, go to, you know, whatever, and you're following my instructions. Am I there? No, I'm at home, aren't I? Yeah. But I'm still it's making yeah, you do. <laughs> so there's a line of connection there, which is actually, we used to be a telephone line, is now satellite receivers and transmitters. Which is mad, isn't it, really? Because if I got my mobile out and rang your mobile, my mo signal would go to a repeater, up to a satellite, back to a repeater, and back to your phone. And if you're only a few feet away. That's mm -hmm. technology, isn't it? Crazy. Mm -hmm. Be easy if I just said it to you. Mm -hmm. But you see, this is how we communicate over distance now. In a way, you see, life imitates yes. life. There's yeah. nothing new in the universe. Yeah. This remoteness of life, controlling life and animating life, we are, we are doing now ourselves. We're remotely controlling things across the planet. We can we con control things in space now. We send satellites to Mars and so forth. Mm. You remember when we talked about the Avatar? Some of you have seen the film Avatar, some yeah. of you from Robin. And that was a very good example because the operators there in that world. Did, did you two see Avatar? Mm -hmm. So basically if you think of your spiritual self as the operator in the cocoon, and the consciousness being transferred to an avatar body, this is your avatar body. And if you just dwell on that idea, I mean I went into it quite a bit before, so I won't go into it again, you can see very clearly what's happening. And it's the same with the at atom. An atom is an avatar body of a spark of the spiritual divine. When atoms come together, they form molecules, which is a, de which is a congregation of sparks of the divine. Now, now, someone asked a very high person, um, what, does, what do these sparks look like at, at the divine level? Are they walking about? Are they like, have they got shapes and forms? And, and the person said, no, they have not. At the spiritual level, at the level of the monad, what is happening is, A differentiation is taking place within that immense consciousness, like a thought in your mind. Mm -hmm. But it's a thought that lasts almost an eternity, mm -hmm. whereas your thoughts and my thoughts mm -hmm. only last a few moments. Nevertheless, it's based on the same pattern. So we back to the same principles again. Everything follows the same patterns. There are so many patterns in creation, we call them archetypes, and everything follows those patterns and works out variations with them and that's how we, how we proceed. 
So time now, we turned our attention to, I mean, this was only a look at involution. The study material you were given should have given you more com- cohesive view of it. Yeah. But I've skipped about a bit. I just want to, I just want to inspire you really. I, wa- I want you to see that this is, this is a living thing. We can point to things outside and we can see that they started on the divine plane and now they're here. We don't have to go into the details of that. What we need to do now, though, is start on the other side of this equation, which is evolution. Now, evolution is when the many gradually become the one. So the one becomes the many, the many becomes the one. And evolution, I don't want to complicate it, because it can can be very complicated, and I want to keep things very simple. Evolution, at the human level, um, starts with the human being. But at the cosmic level, starts with the mineral kingdom. Because the mineral kingdom is the furthest point from spirit which Maha reaches as it, as it flows out into matter and organises it. It's actually, the first thing it organises at the physical level is m- minerals. What we call rocks and dust and mm-hmm. all that. And it has its... There are other planes. Yes, after but that. after the mineral. Level, no, before right? the mineral. Level. Yeah, before. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what we're saying now, we, we've done all that in, involving. Mm-hmm. It's only a sketch you look at it. Yeah. At the end of that involution process, the the stopping point, the terminal, is the physical world. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and in terms of Maha building forms to express and to experience in those forms, of the physical world uh, is the mineral kingdom. Mm-hmm. Now, you, we need to understand also, and this is a subject of another talk later in the year, that Maha um, does this in seven pulses, which we call seven life waves, all of which go through this process one, one following another. We actually call them the kingdoms. So we've got the mineral kingdom, which is one pulse. We've got the vegetable kingdom, which is another pulse. We've got the animal kingdom, which is a third pulse. And we've got the human kingdom. Those are four physically um, um, appearing life pulses of Maha. There are three behind the scenes still working their way towards physical matter. And those are the three elemental kingdoms. So we've got four kingdoms, in uh, seven kingdoms in all. Three on the inner planes and four on the outer plane. Mm-hmm. Right. Now the first of those four is the mineral kingdom. Now you could say to yourself, well what good is the mineral kingdom to a divine mind? Surely it's a bit, bit of a letdown really from being a divine mind to suddenly being, you know, eventually becoming locked up in mm-hmm. minerals and rocks and all that kind of stuff. But you see, this this is what it's about. It's about experiencing, experiencing, not inspiring, not experiencing, experiencing. Maha's come out, got itself into this matter, which it is organised into the forms we call iron, copper, lead, zinc, you know, limestone, granite, um, gold eventually rubies, diamonds, crystals. This is an evolution taking place because it didn't, didn't, it didn't all appear at once. Right? So when the mineral kingdom is forming, the elements form and from these elements, you know, in the mineral world of the physical plane, like in the earth itself is what we're talking about, you've got volcanic action, you've got the earth crust moving around, you've got magma flowing, you've got water, flowing, you've got aridness, you've got ice, um, intense heat, you've got things grinding against each other. As these chemicals and elements and minerals are being produced, the catalysts are formed and they produce other things, like precious metals, diamonds are formed through pressure and carbon over a long, long period. This is an incredible process. If you look back over the age of the planet to where we are now, it's produced all these incredible materials 
out of the basic matter which Bohat had made, which was undifferentiated, really. So, the Divine Mind, Mahat, is residing in the Mineral Kingdom, it's experiencing this incredible pressure of minerals, the heat and the grinding, and it's, it's producing what it can from that basic template. It's, it's evolving um, and creating as much um, um, uh, e evolutionary improvement and, and diversification as it can. You see this everywhere. The vegetable kingdom is so diverse. It's not just a few fern trees, is it? Like it was billions of years ago. It's got a lot of fern trees. Now there's so many, so many different plants. You can't categorize them all. So this is what life does. It doesn't just go and do something. It does everything it possibly can with that thing. It doesn't just make a human being. It makes billions of different kinds of human beings with different temperaments and different attributes. So in the mineral kingdom, it's doing the same thing. That's why we've got such a rich mineral kingdom. What it does next is, having exhausted its, um, its um, energies in the mineral kingdom and gone as far as it can to produce variety, it then moves on and uses the same processes that, it's, that it has produced in the min, in mineral kingdom and, and produces an organic version of them. Mm. And we call that the plant mm. world. You know, like I said, we're not going into detail because the details will be very demanding between these two kingdoms. But we can, you know, it's, it is laid down. We can go into them. And then elsewhere in other talks, I've gone into them much more deeply than I can here. You know, you just have to trust me with the fact that everything you see in the base of the kingdom, all the patterns, you can see their origins in the mineral mm. kingdom. Mm. The way crystals grow. Mm. Same way the plants grow. But where crystals grow with rigid structures, where the molecules align strictly, in plants the, the molecules are lined in a different fashion and they're flexible. Um, but when Mahat is doing this in the Vegetable Kingdom, another pulse of Mahat has come behind and he's occupying the Mineral Kingdom. Yeah. Right? Because the plants need the Mineral Kingdom in order to grow and to form. So plants are minerals in a plant form. Later, when Maha moves to what we call the animal kingdom, animals are plants and minerals in an animal form. All the patterns are the same, except yeah. now they become more elaborate. Mm -hmm. And eventually, that's what we have. <laughs> eventually, the, minerals the human kingdom comes yeah. along, yeah. But by the time Maha has moved into the human kingdom, Pulse of my heart falling behind is occupying the animal kingdom, and another one occupying the vegetable kingdom, another one occupying the mineral kingdom, and three more occupying the elemental kingdoms. Mm. Because every kingdom relies on the other kingdoms. It's a symbiotic mm. existence. Mm. You can see, for instance, um, the, the similarity, the, the, the development of um, the circulatory system in human and animal mm -hmm. bodies, where you've got the veins and the, mm -hmm. and, and the lungs expiring and inspiring. I, I, in plants, you've got veins in leaves, and, mm -hmm. and you've got this uh, expiration and inspiration, and you've got this photosynthesis with the sun. Mm -hmm. These are systems which are the same as in animals and humans, but are much more simplified at that level. Mm -hmm. When it comes into the animal kingdom, they're, they're, they are made more elaborate. And they're they built on and built on, and refined and refined. And in the human kingdom, they're refined again. Now, here is something that will ex explain something that I'm saying. Because when we, the pulse of Maha, divine consciousness mind, was in the animal kingdom before we reached the human kingdom, we didn't take animals to the same level that they are now. When we left that kingdom, the animals are much more basic. We entered the human kingdom and we've been working on the human form. Meanwhile, another pulse occupied the animal kingdom and has continued to work on the material it, it, it inherited and make more and more sophisticated animals. Similarly, so has the plant kingdom because 
the giant tree ferns are now being replaced by all these wonderful things that we see around us and roses and flowers. So, what have I done? So, a, a little, a little um, ditty now is that um, we, we say in our cult parlance that um, the spirit, talk about divine mind really, but spirit is unconscious in the mineral kingdom dreams in the vegetable kingdom, stirs or awakens in the animal kingdom and becomes fully conscious or self-conscious in the human kingdom. So what has happened now is that this fragmentation has taken place, we've ended up in the densest point of matter, the mineral kingdom. From there Maha builds more and more complex and sensitive forms in order to express and to experience. It's no good if it just stays static. When it moves to the vegetable kingdom, it produces even more complex forms. And it, it has a relationship in, in look, I mean, look at plants, they have this ability to attract insects and pollinators. Mm -hmm. They have their own sort of, yeah, little communities of plants and it's a struggle su for survival because some plants will dominate others and so forth. It has to evolve strategies to survive. Mm -hmm. This is all part of the evolving process. In the animal kingdom, you get social groupings. Mm -hmm. You know, animals actually have friends. They have family groups. They have herds and flocks. Mm -hmm. And, and their, their own sort of inherent wisdom, intu you know, their, their own instinctive behaviour, which helps them to survive. And, and they learn, they're able to learn the best way to do a thing and the best place to go and so forth. And, but they're still very rudimentary, but they're so much more sophisticated now than the minerals and even the plants. Mm -hmm. So the life that's inhabiting these creatures is, is in a vehicle which is far more sensitive and far more able to express itself amongst its fellows mm -hmm. and have a relationship with its fellows and far more able to experience a world from a higher point of view. When it moves into the human kingdom, it goes up another step. Now what do you think is the difference between the animal bodies of the animal kingdom and the animal bodies of the human kingdom? Because we're all said and done, these are animal bodies. They may be superior animal bodies, but they're still animal bodies. We call them human bodies because we, we occupy them. But you put them on a bunch of slabs, there's not much, that much difference between a human being and a pig. Mm. So what do you think is the difference then between the human and the animal? Consciousness. Consciousness, yeah. Mm. Awareness. Awareness, so yes, absolutely, yes, awareness. Mm. It's a, there's a greater awareness, isn't there? Ability to think. Ability to think. Well, animals do think, but you're very close, because what I'm searching for is a special kind of think. Will. And it is inspired by will and this is the kind of thinking that goes on at the higher levels of mind whereas the animal world and the lower human kingdom only concerns itself with survival so we call that aspect lower mind it's all one mind really but it's the mind the part of your mind which is orientated towards physical life the five senses and the emotions it's tied up with emotions the higher side of mind is actually facing the other way, if you like, into spirit, and it's part of the spiritual triad. And it's that aspect of mind that humans have, that animals haven't had awakened yet. They've got it, but it's not awakened. Now what awakens it in human beings is the first Logos. We have the third Logos, who made all the material. We have the second Logos, who organised it all into forms and vehicles, and consciousness. And then we have the first Logos, which is will, purpose which now flows in from its own plane meeting the returning life ways that are evolving into the human kingdom flashes down and, and, and enlightens the higher mind sparks and wakes up higher mind and higher mind is where you, your imagination is higher mind is where you can you can you can um, you can you can suggest things to yourself you can you can pose a question 
I'm not talking about questions of what's to eat, <laughs> which most of it, I, I come across that question several times in a day. Actually. <laughs> and I usually ask a certain person, <clears throat> and it's, um, get it yourself. No, um, it's, you see, with an, if I was an animal, I'd only be concerned with where the next grass is. I said, there's some nice grass, and I'm beating the grass. And that's, that's fine. But as a human being, I look at the grass and I think, food, yeah, but what can I do with it? Perhaps I put some cheese sauce with it, or perhaps I saute it in a bit of... There's a difference there, isn't there? I can be creative about that bit of grass, that bit of food. And, you see, human beings, because they've got this higher mind awakened, for the first time in its entire creation, we have arrived at a being that can actually question its own its own existence. existence. You know, that's what we're doing here, isn't it? We're questioning our existence. We're saying, "What's it all about? Where did we come from? What are we then?" You won't find a bunch of sheep going, ah, "What are we?" <laughs> um, I don't know. What do you think? Oh. Well, I think we just will factories really. <laughs> <laughs> you know, human beings will actually ask that question and have been asking it for centuries Descartes actually thought about it thought about it and said well at the end of the day I'm thinking about it therefore I am at least I know I am but what he is he never came to a conclusion on this, this is an amazing thing isn't it? because this knowledge has been known right back to Atlantis and Lemuria um, but you need to have a certain you need to come to a certain level of mental um, awareness and agility to be able to even understand the question, never mind the answer. Because, because you find that in the, in the opening series of human king, the human kingdom, the earliest stages, humans didn't ask those kind of questions. No, they, they, they maybe was in awe of things, mm. which is a step up from animals. You know, they would sit, maybe you can imagine a human being sitting around the campfire outside the cave at night mm. with the dark sky because there was no street lamps, was there? And looking at the stars and thinking there was eyes looking down at them because they see animals' eyes reflected in the campfire. Mm. And they'd think, oh, look at all those animals up there. Maybe. Get there. <laughs> <laughs> what if they come down here and eat us? Yeah. <laughs> so they, they, were, they were thinking, but they had nothing, they hadn't got the mental capacity to start thinking in terms of perspective and all these other things and distance like that. And it wasn't so long ago that they thought they'd fall off the end of the edge of the world. Yes. Mm. Yes, that's it's not, right. Yeah. It's not long ago. Some people still think that. It? Mm. <laughs> it's a flat earth society, it still exists. <laughs> yeah. yes. I've, mind, they, they've never been on a, uh, they've never been on um, on an easy jet, of course, I don't know. <laughs> And not got a passport. What's actually happened? I've got a question and I don't know how to formulate it. It's a bit out, we'll sort it out, yeah. Yeah. When one can be in a certain space and look at a rock and see the alive, that it's absolutely alive, you can see the spirit in the yeah, rock. Yeah. The same thing can happen when you look at plants yeah. and it's like as though they've got their own radiation and they're coming up. What is actually happening to no, I'll, tell you, you, I'll, I'll tell you what's happening and it's a very good question Ruth actually. Very good question. The plant or the, or the rock and because you've experienced that every time you look at a rock it's not the same anymore, it's is it? It's not the same, yeah. even though it looks flat. Yeah. The awareness is there, yeah. but it isn't, but so it is alive. Because these things have to be triggered, you see. It's like, um, if you could get back into the mind of an animal, and you, know, you can actually do that in, in some circumstances, you can actually combine um, convergent minds with an animal, and then you see the world from an animal's point of view. Mm. And when you do that, you see a world that is, um, well, beautiful, actually, and, and where it's, it's like all one. Um, there's, n there's no great meaning to it, 
but there's a connectedness to everything. That's the main thing. Animals don't feel isolated. When you come into the human kingdom, the first thing that happens is the consciousness within a human being feels totally isolated. Mm-hmm. And this is why I said right at the beginning that evolution in humans, from human terms, actually starts with the human kingdom. But in cosmic terms, it starts with the mineral kingdom. Because it's only when Maha reaches the human kingdom that um, that it that it starts to question things and starts to have the choice. Because when will comes in, it, it, apart from vivifying higher mind, it brings in free will. It means that human beings can do exactly what they want, providing they've got the power to do it. They don't have to just concern themselves with survival, they can concern themselves with destruction as well. Mm. They can concern themselves with killing and destroying. They can concern themselves with painting and poetry. All things that animals don't need time for because you can't eat them. So it's this influx of the first Logos, will, that gives us free will. And because of that, we tend to become um, so isolated as individuals because this free will this um, quickening of the mind in human beings actually makes us individualized. Animals are far more group conscious than we are. It's said that in the animal kingdom proper, um, several animals of a, of a type will have one common soul. And it's only when they reach the top of the evolutionary ladder in, in animal terms that they start to split out into one soul per animal and that is when they enter the human kingdom so when we get into the human kingdom we are actually individual souls and we're individualized mm. right a- any early human activity that tends to keep us in herds or the herd mentality we're still around, around today actually a football crowd mm. it's a herd mentality for instance mm. people in tesco's are herd mentality um people watching carnage street it's herd mentality there's nothing wrong with that but that's because that's our origins from, from the animal kingdom. That's a self protective mode. If everybody's doing it, we're all right. But if it's only me doing it, maybe it's dodgy. You see. But what happens is, as we get more self assured and more aware, we become more individual within the herd. So you can see this with animals, the more domesticated animals in the flocks and in the herds, you get individuals. You see the individual characters developing. I've got four hens at home, each one's different. But, you know, it's harder to see in wild animals, I suppose, mm-hmm. than it is in, in more domesticated animals. Anyway, the point is, in the human kingdom, there's this isolation to begin with, and we are very much individuals. We become very selfish, self-concerned, and very self-centred. So the default mode of humanity is selfishness. Mm. we have to evolve out of that mm. and this is where our evolution takes off because we're talking about now the many becoming the one again and you say how can that happen well it on- only happens when you're passing through and beyond the human stage because what we're le- learning at our higher levels of awareness is to cooperate with each other mm. we did that to some degree in the animal kingdom you see examples in like in the bees and the ants and things, they cooperate, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have to do it now with all this incredible awareness that human beings have. And we stop killing each other, stop starving each other, stop keeping each other in ignorance. Mm-hmm. We, we can wake up to the fact that this is a global village now, this is one world really, and we are one people. Mm-hmm. We're not black, white, yellow, blue, mm-hmm. pink and red. We're just humans. And we're, we're a diversity of types and uh, of um, varieties because we're expressing in every way we can what it is to be humans. Just like animals and all the different kinds are expressing what it is to be animals. But we should be celebrating that difference, not, not picking on each other because of it, not putting each other up and down because of it. This idea of some people being filthy rich and other people being starving, that's not spiritual. You know, we have to evolve out of that. And we are 
we will gradually evolve out of that. But we've still got a long way to go in this cycle before we get back to that state of oneness again. We get glimpses of it in the, on the way, like you're just saying there. I, I can, what's coming to me now yeah. is that it's like a recognition yeah. of that part of consciousness. That unity. That, yes. Yeah. That the sense yeah. when I'm looking and that things happen, it's the recognition of the recognition. that gone. Because it's the first logos, you see, which is the spiritual will, which is where everything is one. It's because the first logos is the is the purpose behind it all. Mm. It's the central point from which everything has occurred. So mm. when when you when you when you align yourself with that, you align yourself with everything. Mm. And whatever you're looking at then becomes, as you say, it, it all becomes in tune. And you don't see yourself separate from it anymore. You, well, you do. You know you're separate, but you also know you're part of it. And that's the amazing thing. That's the magic of it. I think you know. When we were very primitive, before we got this sophisticated mind, we did feel that. But as our minds evolved and we got more clever and smart and more selfish, we closed down to what suits us, and we lost this connectedness, this awareness of our connection to everything. In, in occultism it's said that every single atom is connected to every other atom. Mm. Every single being is connected to every other single being. This is a web of the universe. So there are atoms out in space somewhere. If there's a line of connection to you, and that this is amazing. You see, when, when we have this oneness experience, we usually have it on a local level. So if you're in a woodland or by the seashore, and you go into this wonders and you look around and you say, wow, this is amazing, I am that and that is me. And but you're not seeing Mars, you're not seeing Alpha Centauri, you're not seeing the other side of the universe, because your, your, your level of awareness is still limited. But given time, given enough evolution of time, your awareness will expand. You see, and then the, the whole process of this, the whole reason behind it all, which is what we have to come to, is because it is not just your bodies that are evolving, the minerals, the vegetables, the animals, the human bodies, it's not even just your emotional self that's evolving and your soul and your mental capacity. It's your spiritual spark that's evolving into becoming a flame. And that's the reason why it's doing it. But with it all comes humility. Yes, humility, because how can you feel that you are something superior to everything else when you realize you are that everything else? Mm. It's like, you know, in the Theosophical Society, the first object is to form a, a, um, a nucleus of the universal brotherhood. So you can't look at a, another racial being and, and say, oh, you're less than me, because you're the same as him. You're part of the same creation. As your awareness wakes up to that connectedness, you realize that all life you are all life. Mm. If you put some aspect of it down or harm it, you're actually harming yourself. Yeah. And this is the this is the dawning of awareness that we're coming to now. But you know, don't ever make the mistake. Well, you can if you want. It's not for me to tell you what to do. But you know, the fact is that everything is evolving because the whole purpose of the thing is the spirit to evolve. Spirit has got these latent capacities really which are divine and which are of the measure of a god. But they're not at the beginning, they're just their capacities, their, their potential. But after it's gone through this incredibly, what may seem tiresome process over eons upon eons of time, evolving and evolving, the spirit is waking up these latent capacities and it is becoming aware on its own plane like never before. That spark is getting a flicker of flame, flame is getting higher, so it's expressing itself as a divine being with the power of a god. And that's why we say theosophy, the wisdom of the gods, because it was previous humanities in cycles so long ago we can't even think about them that have been through this process then overseeing the process so that other sparks can go through the same process. You could say 
at some point it was probably one divine being but over all these cycles upon cycles there must be more and more of them and, and, and you know that's a very simplistic way of looking at it but even so if you were the one God as it were and there was nothing else and nobody else you'd be a bit lonely wouldn't you if you could find a way to reproduce yourself you could have a community of yourself you could interact mm. but here we go back to the same thing it's the same pattern being repeated so if we're doing that then that's what the absolute the divine is doing also mm. because we're not separate mm. to that this is the key whatever is going on we're part of it and if we're doing it everything else is doing it or have done it and learned the lesson <laughs> we still got to learn or we're going to do it because we're not evolved to it yet but somebody else has done it something else has done it you see the amazing thing about what we call theosophy is the perennial wisdom is that once you get a grasp of these cycles and these principles and patterns you can see it all then all you have to do is apply your mind to any bit of it apply the same patterns and principles and you can see how it works you may not know all the details of it you may want to spend another three lifetimes working out how Maha actually gets all the way down to the physical plane you can if you want but the principle is that it's heading that way then it's heading back the other way it's a cycle and looking around you everything moves in cycles Remember we said that at the beginning mm -hmm. a few, few weeks ago. Nothing moves outside cycles. Nothing goes in a straight line. It's all cycles. And those cycles are spirals. And spirals yeah. are parts of other spirals and so on. I, I used to be fascinated with the spiral patterns that prehistoric people... Oh, with shells and things. Yeah, no, no, the actual carvings on the stones. And then oh, the I, one, I realized that what they were, I think what they were trying to tell us was, it wasn't a flat circle, it was a spiral. It was a spiral, was yes, that's up. right, yeah. Yeah, so you, you, look at the, you look at the cycle of the zodiac, for instance, mm. 26,000 year cycle, isn't it? So um, we just entered Aquarius now. That means 26,000 years ago, or thereabouts, 25,600 years ago, we were entering Aquarius then. So you say we've come full circle. Actually, we've come full spiral. Because we're not the same creatures now, 26,000 years later, <coughs> as we were then. Mm -hmm. We are, but we've, we've, we've modified ourselves mm -hmm. somewhat. Mm -hmm. And even the, even the Earth, which is spinning, is spinning around the Sun, which is a spiral. And even the Sun is moving at the same time and that's mm. going around the galaxy so the whole thing is spirals moving within spirals I think in the Bible it says wheels within wheels isn't mm. yeah. um, so just to finish off then a few questions that um, are relevant to this course material that you're on now um, forms become complex because they evolve from more simple forms to more complex forms that's what evolution is from the simple to the complex from the um, insensitive to the sensitive from the ignorant to the wise mm -hmm. all that is evolution and what is the destination then of this evolutionary process to return back to the one but now in full consciousness mm -hmm. and what is the means the modus operandi which um, by which all things evolve slightly more obscure but we have covered it what are we here to do what are we here to to evolve, to evolve by, by experience. by experiencing yeah so you see at the end of the day there's no right and wrong there's no failure or success it is all experience <laughs> tell yourself this when you've got a pain you say well I'm experiencing this mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. I'm not dying it's a different experience it does help a bit mm -hmm. except toothaches another matter <laughs> um, and, and having a baby apparently but I'm not And um, you will come across the term in your studies, ever becoming. Mm -hmm. Ever becoming means the spirit is always going through this process 
outwards and inwards. We said in cosmogenesis, the out-breath of Brahm and then the in-breath of Brahm. As the breath comes out, all things become manifest. As the breath is drawn back in, all things return back to the one again. But not to be forgotten. Not to be forgotten, to be remembered Remember. in another cre mm -hmm. creation. And the results of um, evolution in terms of consciousness is that consciousness expands as a result of the experience it goes through and becomes divine and spiritual in its own nature. It, it unfolds that capacity from within itself. And our lower nature as human beings um, is overcome, if you like, or improved upon by um, the awakening of higher mind, which is a spiritual attribute, the will of the Logos. It infuses us with the purpose of creation. But it's, it's something, you see, people used to say a few years back, I remember people saying, oh, well, we have all the truth within us, you see. We don't have to read books or it's all within us. Well, yes, it is. But the trouble is, it's buried within us. And it's, it's, it's implanted within us from the first Logos. But you need the experience, the reading, the learning, the, the um, um, cooperating with each other and so forth, and the thinking, in order to access that information. You will not get it as a divine right. You have to, it's there for you, but you have to access it. And what happens then, as you progress in your understanding of all this, when you come across new ideas and new facts, or you're starting to get the message of something, it, it clicks. And you know you already knew that, but you didn't know where you got it from. <laughs> And um, why does spirit evolve? It evolves because it's compelled to do so because that's the nature of the whole process is to evolve. And one last question which you come across in your course, which parts of creation is destined to become perfect? Everything. Yes. All parts. There isn't a single thing in creation anywhere that isn't destined at some point in the future to become absolutely perfect as a divine being. When we say perfect, we mean fully realized. Because the divine sparks at the beginning of their journey, they're perfect. There's no, no blemishes in them, there's nothing wrong with them. But they've not realized them, their potential. So th when we say perfection in spiritual terms, we mean having realized all our potential. That's perfection. And each phase, each cycle, has a certain um, um, level, which is le which is which is not really our destiny, but it, it is the culmination of that cycle. All elements within that cycle that don't quite reach that fulfilment at the end of that cycle pass on to a, a cycle coming behind and complete it then, because all elements must complete that perfection for that cycle, whether it's a plant, a human being, an animal, or an atom, or a mineral. They all have their designated goals to reach. And they will reach it because they don't reach it in one goal, they'll reach it in the next, and so on. This is why we have more than one life. You know, if in a perfect sort of world, an ideal world, we'd be born, grow up, sort it all out, become divine, and, and go off into some kind of cosmic heaven. But we don't. We, we, we're born, we grow up, we learn a few things, we do a lot of harm. <laughs> you know, we take two steps forward and six steps back, we get into trouble. So we have to have so many lifetimes because each lifetime we don't actually reach that potential of human potential. But we're not expected to in one lifetime anyway. But we are expected to in the full cycle. And most of us will reach that perfection. The few that lag behind because they entered the human kingdom much later than the rest of us. And it's not their fault, they haven't had the full turn. See, animals transferring from the human animal kingdom into the human kingdom, there's a, there's a, there's a sifting going on, a process going on, and at some point the, the door is shut because there's not enough time by any means uh, left in the human cycle to, to get anywhere properly. But the ones who came in rather late and got through, there wouldn't be enough time reasonably to expect them to reach the full potential. But nevertheless, they get as far as they can, and then they come into the next human life wave, 
and they actually then happen to be end up leading the life wave because they've had a head start on everybody else and so you get this term those that are last later will be first yeah. those are first well there we are thank you very much thank you, thank you. Thank you.